Centa Mortgage Approval Center. His brokerage deals with 15 mortgage lenders, including major banks, credit unions, and exclusive lending institutions. Mark works with the borrowers to find them the best rate and most suitable mortgage product. Let Mark work for you. To learn more, call Mark for your free consultation at 705-254-967. Well, welcome to this week's Sports Talk with our Bono, Jim Monaco, myself, and Ari Martellino. How's everybody today? We're good. You today? Good, good. Jim, you're the one who knows most about uh, women's hockey here, so we'll let you uh, take it over and uh, grill uh, Ari on uh, on uh, women's hockey. Yeah, well, welcome tonight, uh, Ari. Uh, you got an interesting story. Uh, you know, uh, a young uh, goalie, uh, you originally had a, a, a scholarship. You decided uh, to go a different route, so we're going to get you to talk about that story. Uh, we we do a lot of uh, recruiting talk on, on here. It's kind of a, one of the topics we like to talk about with the uh, with our with our young athletes, so uh, I think your story is going to be uh, pretty interesting. So uh, first of all, I'll, uh, I'll just tell everybody uh, what you're doing now and, and what, what team you're on and, and uh, if you're, you know, where you're at right now with, with this year's season. Yeah, for sure. So I'm currently playing for Mississauga Junior Hurricanes, um, but because of COVID, I am back home. I'm training at uh, Jamie DeZano's a couple times a week. That's pretty much all the ice I'm getting. But um, like I'm on Mississauga, we have Zoom calls every week. Uh, as far as college going, I'm I'm pretty open book with that. Uh, looking at a couple schools, American and Canadian, but that's all for me right now. Now you had originally uh, had a scholarship, uh, Ari. Could you want to tell everybody about that and how how that started, and then where it's at right now? Yeah, for sure. So I committed to Dartmouth in grade nine. Um, I recently decommitted just after Christmas. I think uh, I committed in grade nine. Obviously, I was very young, just going into high school, um, still playing in the Sioux. I hadn't really moved away yet. Um, and I think I mostly decided to decommit because I ended up committed very, committing very early. Um, and once I moved away, I think as I matured, I realized my priorities and my goals a little more and even how I was as a student athlete. Um, and I decided I could find a better fit. Um, so I did make that decision to decommit. And now I'm looking at other schools. I'm exploring Canadians to, Canadian schools too, which I didn't get to last time. Um, yeah. So we're going looking both U.S. and Canadian. Now, Ari, when you first when you first got your scholarship, where where did uh, you get scouted? Like, were you uh, way uh, at, at summer tournaments like Rush, or were you uh, part of the Ontario Winter Games program? How how did the you first get on that map, especially at such a young age? How did how did that start? Yeah, I think the summer games um, was the biggest scouting opportunity for me. That's where Dartmouth saw me um, first at the summer games and. That really pretty much broke out to Miss Saga too. I, they saw me there too, so that was the biggest recruiting. Now, when you decided to decommit, uh, how exactly does that work? Do you pick up the phone and call them and say, "Hey, I'm sorry, this is not what I want to do anymore"? Is is that how that works? Uh, mostly. So I, I was going back and forth for like almost a month, like mm -hmm. calling my coach now, like Darcy, like, should I do this? Is this the right decision? long talks with my parents obviously but it pretty much came down to that I called my coach at Dartmouth and just saying like I don't think this is the right fit for me anymore and it was really hard like that was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my life right just it's almost yeah. like quitting a job like <laughs> yeah I guess so that would be very hard and I know and I know you're you have very a very nice family and I'm sure they supported you as much as uh, as much as they could uh, they were all on board with this when it all comes said was said and done yeah, of course. Yeah. They obviously ask questions like, are you sure? But um, I don't think I have any regrets um, now, but it was definitely one of the hardest decisions I've had to make. I've had to make I, so. I think that's a good, I think in, at the end of the day, if you're, if you're not happy and that's not what you want to do, I mean, in my own opinion, uh, I think, I think you did the right thing. It's a big commitment. It's a long way to go. Uh, you know, you're, you're closing the door to other opportunities that could possibly be better. So, I, I see where you come from. You you get that opportunity when you're young. It's hard to say no, and I think you did. A, you made a very wise decision. Now, are you got a little bit of a different path uh, in hockey? We had uh, we had Maya Hedrick on here uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, and uh, she she came up playing girls hockey all the way through, like her, and her sister Jana did too as well. And uh, she ended up playing at U of T. Now she's at UMB. You played boys all the way through. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? 
Yeah, I mean, it all started in novice, like when Steve Fenlon took a chance on me at Rome's Rockets, decided to pick a girl goalie. That was really my first year I was goalie. Um, so playing with them, it, um, I enjoyed it. So I decided the next year to go out for, you know, the Sioux Greyhounds, the rep team. And lucky enough, Dave Doucette and, and Jeff Toms took me on. And it was like a great four years. I feel like the boys really like brought up the competitive side in me just playing with them. I mean, there's a couple drafted in the OHL now. They're all pretty much playing AAA. I just, I was lucky enough. <clears throat> playing with all those boys that competitiveness and even just having a season I don't think the girls really got the opportunity to have a season just learning what's that what that was like um I think it really helped me to get to where I am today yeah and the, and the boys all treated you well and you felt like you were a member of the team all, all the way through and stuff like that oh yeah of course all four yeah. years yeah. Um, no and I think was, as a goalie I think as a goalie too uh, not to be uh uh, sexist or anything like that, but I think the guys have a little bit harder shots. So I think it's good for development as a goalie, right? Would you agree with that? Oh yeah, for sure. And I've yeah. heard that from from female coaches too. Like, get on the ice with the boys as much as you can. Like, yeah. it's such an advantage to get on the ice with the boys just to get that quality of shot um, yeah. compared yeah. to the girls. No. Just, then, then when did you decide to go over to the Wildcats? How how old were you uh, when you first went over to play for the Wildcats or the, the Greyhounds? I'm not sure what they were then. Yeah, it, I was first year Bantam, so they were still Wildcats. That was grade nine um, when I committed to with. Um, I think the thing that pushed me to go over was really the OWHA because they don't scout boys hockey, they scout girls hockey. Yeah, yeah. And we had just found that out, so I think that was really the main thing that made me make the switch. And who was the coach of the, the Bantam Wildcats team when you went over there? Chris Perry was the Chris coach. Perry, yeah, and, yeah. and that's good. And uh, and so his, and Milano was on the team, a lot of good. And you guys had a pretty good team, right? Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Both my both years here, where we had pretty good teams. Now, if you if you were if a young goalie was to come to you, a young female goalie was going to come to you, would you would you recommend the path you took, staying with the uh, with the boys as long as you could, and then uh, going over to the girls? Would would you do that all over again if that was uh, had to do it again? One hundred percent, and um, I think. That like playing with the boys, it it helped me grow, and just put, like competing and even just having a season. Like the girls aren't there yet. Like it's it's sad to say, but like there's no there's no comp competition. It's just tournaments, right? But I think the girls will get there. But until they do, I'd say, boys, all the way till you can, because yeah. And we, and we fight a little bit of the, the uh, location problem here in Sault Ste. Marie, right? We talked about this before. Uh, you know, the, there's no league for the girls uh, to play in. They end up playing against boys' teams that aren't, that aren't as good as the boys' teams that you're playing at that, at that level too, right? And so it is a little bit difficult for a, for a young girl to play uh, uh, wildcat hockey. But, and then, like I said, especially for a goalie, uh, I think, you know, the getting hard shots and stuff like that. Now, where are you now with uh, with your recruiting? Uh, are, are you talking to the schools or how, how's that working? Yeah, so I'm talking, like I said, to both American and Canadian. And um, there's a couple of schools in the mix right now. But I'm just I'm enjoying the process this time because last time I don't think I really knew enough to enjoy it. Um, but I like getting to know different coaches and different schools because every school is different, right? So. Yeah, and and do they ask you about uh, about decommitting? Is is that a big thing? And and how does that topic uh, come up? What how do you handle that? Yeah. So well, every school like is different, so they all ask different questions. But that topic normally comes up because um, they're all curious, right? Like why I did it. Um, but I honestly just answer truthfully why yeah. why I did it. It's just the truth's the best there. Um, yeah, that's, uh, and I agree with that too. Yeah. So and, and it's tough this year with no hockey. The no, I mean you you guys uh, film practices when you when you were away playing. Were, were, were they filming practices and stuff like that? Is that yes. What you were yeah. Yeah. Last year we filmed every game, um, yeah. so we have that, and we played two or three uh, four on fours this year. Um, against Etobicoke and against Toronto before everything got locked down. So there's that too that we sent to schools. Well, that's good. So I'll let, uh, I'll let uh, Bono uh, ask you a question here. He's always got something and uh, I'll come back. <laughs> Go ahead, Bono. Yeah. All right. I just wanted to, you know, I know your family pretty well and uh, I just want you to talk a little bit, you know, you come from a really athletic family. Uh, your uncle, 
Uncle Paul was a pretty good athlete back in high school with me and, and uh, you know, and your grandpa and things like that. And so just talk about the influence that your family has had on you and uh, since you were a kid and especially moving away and playing. Oh, yeah. My family is my biggest support. And I always say that, like everyone, my aunts, my uncles, my parents, even my sister, like I couldn't have like moved away without them, like just having – that support and knowing I had that support back home mm -hmm. um, is honestly amazing. Like my parents have supported me all the way, playing boys, coming to girls, moving away. Uh, everyone in my family have, has been super supportive and I honestly couldn't have done this whole experience without them, honestly. So Mr. Tucci was my grade nine basketball coach back in the day. So, um, you know, I, I have some pretty good stories about him, but I can just imagine him, you know, as, a, as your grandfather. Um, how, you know, do you have any stories about Mr. Tucci uh, kind of, you know, at the hockey rink or has he been really supportive of this the whole way, as I assume he would be? Oh, yeah. He he tells me stories all the time about coaching. He always tells me how he was so hard on his team, but he, I've never experienced that. Oh, <laughs> not, you're lucky. Not as hard as <laughs> You're lucky. A, a quick little story. We were in grade nine, and this is when you had just junior basketball in grade nine, and he was our coach. And I actually told him this story the other day because we all still talk about it. We had a couple bad practices, and we were at the small gym in St. Mary's. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're all a bunch of grade nine kids two weeks in. And we just and Mr. Tucci lost it. He he just yelled at us, told us how brutal we were playing, everything. And then he disappeared. He just vanished. He just left practice 20 minutes in. And so we're a bunch of grade nines. We stayed for the entire two hours because we were scared to leave. Because if he came back, we didn't know what to do. So, <laughs> you know, a great little story. But he was he's awesome. He was a great coach. And we appreciated a lot of what he did. I just saw him the other day with uh, Mr. Petula, actually, and he was commenting that we were going to be interviewing you and was pretty excited. Um, so how did the conversation, I know Jim kind of touched on this a little bit, but how did the conversation come up to move? And the reason I ask this is, uh, you know, I look back when I was a kid and when I was your age, and I have a lot of admiration for people, you know, your age being able to move away as a young teen. So I can't imagine how difficult that might have been for you. You know, can you just talk about that decision and kind of what led to that decision? Yeah, for sure. So I think it was it all started in Bantam, right? The summer games really opened my eyes to see what's out there. Uh, it first started, I have a goalie coach in Windsor, uh, Perry Wilson, and there's a PWHL team there. Uh, Southwest and that was the first time I really saw what the PWHL was because I went to go try out with them um, and I think that's the first time I was like wow like can I can I do this like is there something better out there like um, do you know what I mean more competition yep. um, and I think I talked to a couple teams in the league just to see what it was um, and then I started following the league like what's going on and I was like oh wow there's 20 teams in this league like that's amazing. They're, they're having a season. Like I've never really experienced that. Right. Um, and so as I kept talking to coaches and teams in that league, I was like, wow, maybe I can really do this. Like maybe I can play 30 games a year, like in a season. Right. And I think just finding out about that league and like seeing I can play more games really led me to that decision to move away my next year. Yeah, just, so what's just to be clear, just to be clear too, uh, but a lot of people don't know this. The PWHL is kind of like a, a equivalent to uh, the OHL for uh, for boys. That's pretty accurate, right, Ari? Yeah, Basically yeah. Basically the same thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go awesome. ahead, Bono. Sorry. So, what's the best part about moving away? What has been the best part about moving down? Um, I there's there's a lot of great parts, like being able to play in a league with kids two, three years older than me and facing that i think even living like away from home seven hours away in someone else's house around a different family um like experiencing that um going to even like maybe a bigger school um like to prepare me for college like i'll be living away from home but i think the one of the best things is the hockey and being able to practice with girls who are going to team canada and team Ontario and being able to compete with those girls. That's, I think that's the. 
And what's the hardest part of moving away? Uh, being away from my family, for sure. I think I struggled with that my first year. Um, I was a little homesick, and that's definitely the hardest part, just being away from them. That Like, I've been here my entire life, right? Never been away from them, and that was the hardest part. So what advice would you give if there was another student uh, student athlete in a similar situation to you, a good athlete, you know, male, female, and they're thinking about moving away, but, you know, they're, it's a young age for them. They're apprehensive. You know, they don't want to leave their friends and they're kind of nervous about it. What advice would you give someone in that situation? Honestly, I would just like weigh out the pros and cons. The biggest thing like for my family was like finding a good family to live with that were similar to us, um, like that love the game as much as my family did and would support us like um, throughout the whole thing. And I really think the two families I've lived with have done that. And that was the biggest thing, even finding a great coach. Darcy has been like super supportive through that whole thing. Darcy's my coach now. Um, and I think that was one of the biggest things. But honestly, I would say it's it's scary i will not like deny that at all um but you have to get past that first part and then everything opens up and it's just so much fun being on the ice with girls at that level i think that's amazing advice i really do i think it's important for kids if they think you know for for young men and women if they think that it's the right move to kind of how do you get over that hump right how do you get over that fear and that apprehensiveness of going to do that so i think hearing your story and you talking about it is really important because it might encourage other people if they feel that's the path they need to take that it's doable and it's something they can do so very well said thank you now, Ari, Ari, what's uh, what is you must be a good student you, you had committed to a good school and stuff like that uh, uh, so school must be important to you right mm -hmm. yeah for sure and, and do you know what you want to do and what you want to pursue in school? Because uh, I think girls athletics are, are a little, I mean, I'm going to sound sexist for the second time on here. I think most good, good uh, female athletes are, are good students and that's not always the case with boys. And I don't, I'm not trying to be, it's just a fact. It's just a fact. So, uh, I mean, what, what do you want to pursue in school and what, what are you looking to do? Yeah, well, I've always had to work hard for my grades, but school is obviously very important to me. I don't have a specific path. That's something I'm still working out, but I enjoy accounting and finances. I think that may be a path. And I also did pretty well in physics this year. So take that route. I, I enjoy all the sciences, bio and chem. So the, those are the two paths, I think. Maybe the sciences, maybe finance. I haven't really decided yet, but those are the two yeah and, and i know you have a hockey family do you, do you do you watch a lot of hockey yourself yeah i actually before i came on here i was watching the ncaa championship because that's this weekend yeah. um but obviously downstairs i'm sure there's an nhl game on right now <laughs> yeah and, and is, there, is there a goalie in particular in the nhl or uh, someplace that you try to uh play like or model your style after uh, yeah, I've always watched Braden Holpe. He's not having the best year this year, no, but no, no. <laughs> but I've always watched him. Um, even Carter Hart. I mean, Philadelphia is my favorite team, but um, I've always watched him. He's so calm in the net, and I, I think that I'm trying to be. So, yeah. That's awesome. Go so, on. yeah, I have one more question. So, you know, being a goaltender, I've always kind of wondered this. You know, obviously, forwards in hockey, you, there's 12 forwards on a team. You know, there's nine defensemen, you know, or sorry, eight defensemen a lot of times. You know, usually there's one, maybe two goalies. Do you find it, have you found the competition more difficult, you know, being a goalie? And how, like, how, how has the competition been down south? And how do you feel like you've kind of lived up to the expectation down there? Yeah, of course. Well, my goalie partner last year was was amazing, um, Mireille mm -hmm. Kingsley. She's at Providence right now, um, but she was with Team Ontario, like Team Canada and Calgary. And like just being by her side and competing with her, like helped me grow. Like going in last year, I knew I was going to be like a backup learning, um, but competing with her, competing at that level really like helped me grow. And I think as I as I like have gone up, I've always had to compete. Like my goalie partner in boys, like Noah, we've always 
we're fighting for a spot. I shouldn't say fighting, but competing for a spot, yeah. right? And I think it helps me. Like, I'm a very competitive person. So I think I need that to strive just to be able to compete um, against my goalie partners. Absolutely. Is there a time limit that you've set to make a decision on what to do at the next level or where to go? Uh, not specifically because of COVID it's, it's kind of hard to set a time limit, um, with that because schools can't really come watch, um, like, and they're all in playoffs right now. Um, but I'm looking at doing a gap year too, which a lot of female athletes do. Um, so I do have time that I'm not really looking to rush it, to rush into anything right now. That's great. Mm -hmm. now, are you, we always ask everyone this. Can, can you name a couple people that have been, uh, and, and obviously your parents, but other than your parents, people that have been uh, big influences uh, to you, like good coaches you've had over the years or uh, anyone that's been a big influence on your, uh, your hockey career so far? Of course. There's so many. I don't think I've had a bad coach, honestly. Um, but like Steve Fenlin, Dave Doucette, Jeff Tom, Sav, that whole coaching staff and boys, um, helped me even Chris Perry, Jeremy Stevenson really started my career in girls and, um, my goalie coach in Windsor, Perry Wilson. Um, he really helped me form my, um, like goalie position, like who I was as a goalie. And I think more importantly, my coach right now, Darcy Bricky and even Josh and Kristen, um, they're their coaching staff in Mississauga. I honestly wouldn't have gone through last year without them and without their support. Um, and I think they really helped me grow as an athlete. And one thing, one thing I know uh, too, as a goalie, is, is you got to let things roll off, right? And that's really important. And and are, are you good at that? Like, if you get let in a, a bad goal early in the game, is it? Oh no, this is gonna be a bad night. Or are you good at just rebounding and uh, refocusing and just putting that behind you? That that's got to be tough. Honestly, I was never good at it. <laughs> Coming up through boys, I was terrible at it. But I think um, last year and going under Kingsley, who was such a calm goalie and let everything go, helped me learn. I'm still not the best at it. I, I'm i very hard on myself, but I think I'm still learning. And that's honestly the hardest piece of being a goalie, right? So. Yeah, um, it's tough. I mean, my son yeah. was a goalie when he was young, not, not, not at any high level or anything like that. And I'd be in the stands. And if he let a goal in early, I was like, oh, oh, oh here we go. This is going to be a long night. <laughs> it would be, right? It's just, a, yeah. it's, just it's, it's such a tough thing. And, and there's so much responsibility. And uh, that's why you got to admire the goalies. That, that, that's, that's such a tough thing, right? Yeah, it's a mental game for sure. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I, I, played, I played goalie once in novice because I really wanted to. So I got to play for a whole year and I loved it and wanted to keep playing. My mom, of all people, wouldn't let me play goalie anymore because it was too much pressure on her. So, yeah, <laughs> so I understand. Do you, your, your parents get stressed out watching you play in that uh, in <laughs> Because I know it's um, really stressful. It, it obviously is stressful. I, I don't. I think they do. I just don't think they show it. Like yeah. they, they don't tell me if they do. But I mean, I have a feeling they do. It's, it's. I'm a goalie. You got yeah. to right. <laughs> And and the thing is, everyone in the stands is blaming the goalie too. So so as a yeah. parent, you got to kind of slide away from all the uh, other parents as they start start blaming you. I'm I'm sure. I mean, you're obviously a really good goalie, so that didn't happen often. But there's there's those nights, right? Of course, there's always yeah. those nights. Yeah, yeah. Well, Ari, right, one thing I wanted to ask, and, I, and I'm always fascinated by this because um, you know, obviously, uh, I used to do some uh, goal judging with the Sioux Greyhounds and penalty box. And goalies always, how do I say this nicely? They always seem to be in their own little world or have their own little tendencies or their own, you know, some goalies were just a, cre are, are just a creature of habit on the ice with things that they do and routines and things like that. Do you have a routine that you like to follow pre-game, during game, you know, those types of things? Yeah, I, I do. I do my ball work always. Um, before a game, I always run back to the dressing room. Um, that's just a little something. And even on the ice, I always twirl my stick into my blocker. That's just a little thing. And I, one thing I developed this year was every time I get a scored on, I think about like what I did wrong on the way to the boards. And then on the way back, it's completely out of my head. So that's a little thing that I developed this year. But besides that, I'm not 
very superstitious. I am. There's, but there are way more superstitious people than me. So when you're playing for uh, Canada in the Olympics, when when we see you doing those couple <laughs> things, we can say we know what she's doing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so hopefully yeah. I'll get there one day. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, and also, I, I I'm always fascinated by this too because I know all hockey players are superstitious. So you gave us a couple things. Are there any other things you do that you know that before game, pre game? Do you have any other major superstitions? Uh, one thing I always drink a Gatorade after a game. I have no clue why, and it has to be white. Because fun, <laughs> funny story, actually, it, when I played boys, my dad was like the manager. Um, and he always bought the Gatorade. And Jeff Toms was like, you have to buy white so it doesn't stain our white jerseys. Because if you get orange, <laughs> it'll stain our jerseys, right? Yeah, makes That's sense. Oh, good I point. always drink white Gatorade so it won't stain my jersey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And and is that is that a, a dream of yours, though, Ari, to, to get in uh, to the national program, to get in? Uh, I mean, how, do they, how does that work? How, how do you even get on that radar? Yeah, so I, you can always pretty much get on that radar if you're good enough, but it really leads up from like U16 Team Ontario to U18, and it's all pretty much a ladder going up. But I think there are a couple girls where they haven't been through that process at all and do end up getting on that team, right? But um, I've been fortunate enough to to play for Team Ontario at the in the summer games and. I mean, I'm on the long list now, which I mean is honestly a dream come true. Just being on that long list um, for Team Ontario, that's I'm very fortunate about that. But um, yeah, Canada is a dream, definitely. And Ari, for the people, sorry, Jim, for the people who don't know, can you explain what the long, the OWHA U18 long list is? Yeah. So from they pick a, a girls, there's um, like 60 girls they pick from that to play. Um, for Team Ontario, they have two teams, blue and red. Typically, the red team is the like higher, more better, better athletes. Um, they normally win, but those two teams go on to play for a Canada Cup. So they play all the other provinces um, in Canada, and they do a tournament. So they pick those athletes from the long list. But because of COVID, they haven't picked Team Red and Team Blue. Um, so I'm just sitting on that list for now. And, and how many goalies are on that list, Ari? Uh, it depends each year. Um, so they ha they pick four. There's usually like ten or twelve on that list. And and in a normal year, would it would it be a tryout, or they would just pick by what you've done during the season? Yeah. So they, well, they pick the long list from the season, and then they do like almost a training camp, and they pick from there, and then. It's almost like a tryout, but you have to get like invited to the tryout. Yeah, and that doesn't look like it's going to happen this year from right now, right? Yeah, they they haven't really said anything. They're yeah. just yeah waiting yeah. right now. Well, that's good. So, uh, you guys have got anything else? Yeah, I got one more. I got one more quick one. So, all right, um, you know, you've played hockey a lot of years. What's your best hockey memory? Oh, there's so many. I mean, I know it's a tough question. So yeah, yeah. you can say a couple if you'd like, but yeah. I'll, yeah. So summer games, I think was one of my highlights. Um, like all three Sioux girls that were there, Maya Hedrick, Real Caruso, we all won a medal out of that, yeah. um, which I think was a great experience for all of us. Um, winning the OHFs. Um, and I, th I think it was Adam, second year Adam. That was an amazing experience just being around all those top tier athletes and even going to the OHFs in my Dewey major year. Um, those were probably my biggest highlights from there. That's awesome. Actually, I do have one more. Sorry. I'm just thinking about this. So, you know, you played rep hockey with the boys growing up, right? Which was, you know, which is a pretty amazing accomplishment. Being the only female on that team, how did the boys treat you? Did you feel, you know, did you feel uncomfortable at all? You know, just kind of talk a little bit about that for other people who might be considering doing something similar. Yeah, I, I, there was never a point where I was like, ooh, like, I'm so uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, there was never really a point um, in that. Um, it, I had a great team. Like, all the boys 
were so easy. Like we were all friends. Um, there was never a point where I was very uncomfortable. Like obviously going into PE, I was in my own room. <laughs> I changed yeah. to my own room. But even even at that, I still felt like I was a part of the team, and um, they all made me feel welcome. So it was good. Yeah, I, I, I'll jump on the, on to that question. When you did go to play with the girls in uh, mm-hmm. in in Bantam, it must have felt nice to be. You must have felt a little bit more a part of the team because you didn't have to leave the room to change. You could you could room with the other girls on the road, stuff like that. So that must have been nice too, right? Oh yeah, for sure. That yeah. just feeling included, like not get having to dress in a bathroom or a storage closet, right? Yeah. Uh, just yeah. being in the room with the girls was it was nice. Yeah. 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 So. Well, all right. Really appreciate this. I'm not sure if the other guys have anything else, but you're, you know, extremely well spoken and, you know, we threw a lot at you tonight. So uh, I thought you handled yourself extremely well. And, you know, thank you for representing the Sioux the way you are and the way you do down there. And, you know, we'll continue to support you. And, you know, if you have any big announcements you'd like to make, you can always reach out to us and we'd love to have you back. So uh, thank you so much for everything you did for everything you're doing and uh, great job today. Guys, do you have anything else? No, again, th- thank you very, very much, and uh, good luck to you in, in your uh, your quest uh, going forward. Uh, I'm sure you'll be successful, so uh, good luck to you, and thank you very much for coming on. And Thanks for having me. Sorry, Ari, the question, the question I have is about when, now you're on the ice now, are you on the ice now with you being in Sault Ste. Marie? Yeah, I'm on training with Jamie DeZano right now. And talking about like Jamie DeZano, that's the EPTP goaltending here in the mm-hmm. Sioux, but the thing about training with them is he has a Blind River Beavers goalies, the Sioux Thunderbird goalies. Um, he's trained Michael Doan, who's passed, but he's trained goalies at all different levels. So training with Jamie, do you get to train with those guys also when at his facility? Yeah. Well, so right now I'm training with um, Maya and Chelsea. The, those are just two other girl goalies in the Sioux. Um, in the summer, I did get the opportunity to train with like Gavin DeZano I went, was on the ice with Tyson Kalina at one point, um, which is which is amazing. But just Jamie having that experience of training other goalies like that, I think really helped me um, grow. Like I, I found myself being a better goalie at the end of the summer, just training with him. And even now coming home and I just, I feel like I'm stronger and, and just an all around better goalie. And it goes to show that coming home, you get to be on the ice where a lot of your teammates aren't even be able to get on the ice in Southern Ontario, right? Yeah, exactly. I'm one of very few on my team getting on the ice, which I'm very fortunate to have that resource. They get to do the workouts, but you get to be on the ice at the same time. Yeah. 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 Well, Ari can't thank you enough. And like Tony said, and Jim said, is if you are going to make an announcement, we'd love to have you back on to, uh, to make that, uh, that that announcement. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, I, guys, just an, another uh, you know amazing representative for for Sault Ste. Marie and kind of you know the what we have to offer up here. It, it's unbelievable to see. Like I, every time we do these, I don't know why I'm so shocked at how well spoken and how uh, yeah. just a, how amazing these young people are. Yeah, I'm the exact same, uh, Bono. I, I, it's always amazing how well spoken. She was great, and uh, they just uh, they they're right. They're 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 great, and it's uh, awesome. And I'm sure she's going to succeed uh, in whatever she wants to do, right? And uh, so it's yeah. nice to it, see. It's funny when she was talking about decommitting. You know, I was thinking back because I mean, I was I mean, I just I played football. That was it. Wasn't a big deal at all. But I I committed to Waterloo. And I ended up decommitting about three weeks before training camp and switching over to Western, right? And I remember that conversation and I remember how hard that was. And that was just, you know, that's just that that was just football here. I can't imagine what that would have been like for her. Like I I just I oh it's hard. I so big, I mean good I for her. Big dif- a big difference is when you decommitted, they were high fiving each other. Here they were, uh, they, were upset <laughs> they were like, we don't have to deal with this guy. <laughs> Thank it's God you finally did it. That's right. But, uh, yeah, no, she's awesome. And then, you know, I wanna, when we asked her to come on, I didn't know that she had uh, decommitted. And, and, I, and I asked her mother, is it okay if we talk about that? And she was great about it. And she's, when I asked about it, decommitting, she said the right thing. Yeah, just tell the truth. And, and it's, yep. it's so true. And uh, she's very open to talk about it. And uh, 
I, th I thought she was awesome. And, uh, you know, and like you said, Bono, the, I don't know why I was surprised because she's the, the, all the young people we have on here are so great. It's uh, it's awesome to talk to them. And like yeah, I said, to her before, sorry, sorry, before we get on the show is about decommitting still to, to, to be recognized by an Ivy League school at that stature, Dartmouth, yeah. it's just huge alone, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, it, go it ahead. Is, it's amazing. It, it's absolutely amazing. And it also, you know, again, it's, it's a testament to families who are willing to make the sacrifices too. Right. And, you know, and are able to make those sacrifices. So, you know, really well done. Now, yeah, it's tough. And we talk about this with the girls a lot. I mean, we, we had Maya on before the girls a lot of time are, uh, sadly they're in, they're in the situation where where they got to, where they got to leave town. And I know there's other girls, uh, that are playing out of town. I'd like to get uh, maybe we'll get a couple of the other ones uh, uh, on on here. Uh, there's a few other ones. Uh, you know, she mentioned uh, Brielle uh, Caruso, uh, yeah. who's committed in the CIS school. We should we'll try to get her on one day. And uh, uh, Milana Perry is playing out of town. I'm pretty sure she's another really good player. So uh, you know, it's interesting. The girls are in a little bit of a tough situation in the, in the Sioux because uh, there's no leagues for them to play in. So it's, it's tough. So. Uh, but uh, it's good, and it's it's good for us to talk about the girls a little bit sometimes because it's a little bit of a different world, right? And uh, a lot of people don't know it, so it's nice it's nice to promote the girls. And then talking on like on that, on that note, Jim, you've been working with some of the boys in town the last two weeks uh, with your skills camp and stuff like that. Can you talk a little bit about, with no football happening right now? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we finally we finally were able to get something going. Uh, you know, I, I just once the lockdown ended, I just picked up the phone and I called the city and said, "Listen, can we get the uh, can we get the indoor facility?" Uh, I booked six weeks originally. I booked uh, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays at four. I wanted uh, skill guys and some defenders on Tuesdays and the uh, the the big lineman on Thursdays. But I was getting so many calls and emails that I had to pick up another hour, and I still ended up turning away people. So we go Tuesday night Tuesday nights at four. Uh, Tuesday nights at 10 and Thursday nights at four, I guess Thursday afternoon at four. Uh, and uh, there we're, we're right full. Uh, you know, it's a little strict. We could, we only can have 25 people in the building, including coaches. Uh, you know, we have to follow all the, uh, all the protocols and, you know, uh, safe, uh, you know, they, they don't have to wear their masks while they're doing the drills. They have to wear them into the building. They got a social distance in line. You know, we, we sanitize the footballs and all the equipment we use all the time, but uh, it's been really well, good, and the, the kids are thrilled. And uh, you know, we got we got the top-notch coaches out there. You know, we got uh, we got uh, Jordan Hoover out uh, working with the the, the defenders and uh, Ray Duplin and uh, you know uh, uh, Mitch Stadnick and all these guys. You know, uh, we got we got all young uh, young university guys. Uh, Cody Wheaton. Uh, we'll talk about the Wheaton family in a second. Cody came out to help last week with the linemen, so. Uh, it's been good, and I, you know, I don't even know how much the, the, the players care what they do. They just happen to be playing football, and so uh, it's, it's you know we're not going to make them uh, the best players in the world in six weeks, but they're out there. They're getting back involved in the sport that they love, and uh, it, it, it's been fantastic, and it's been really, uh, really good. You know, you have to jump through a few extra hoops, had to make sure we were properly insured and all that stuff. But uh, I just wanted to get the kids back on the field, and I'm, I'm glad they're happy to be there. So that, that's been nice. And, and one thing about that, I was actually at the arena the other day or yesterday talking and somebody said they heard how well your skills camp or is going. If there's no football this summer, I heard a lot of parents saying, I hope Jim Monica continues it right through the summer. Is that something you might consider? Well, we got uh, actually that's why I couldn't come on uh, on, uh, on Wednesday night. We got an email from the city on, on uh, Tuesday asking us what our plans were you know basically uh, we have to go ahead and try and book a field uh we have to uh decide what we're going to do so i mean we don't really know where we stand yet right so what we decided was we'll book the field we'll put our name in we came up with a little bit of a plan and uh, if we're able to play uh you know on the field you can have 50 kids uh 50, 50 people including coaches so uh we'll We'll try to divide the cohorts up. I think we'll probably end up going with the older kids, though. Uh, I think we talked about doing three groups, uh, you know, uh, grade uh, sevens and eights, uh, grade nines and tens, grade elevens, twelves, and, and one year after that. It's kind of what we decided, but that's kind of loose planning. Uh, it's tough with the younger kids. Uh, you know, the parents can't even be in the stands. So, uh, you know, if you're, a, if you're a parent of a 10 or 11-year-old and, and your kid's on the football field, uh, uh, it's tough. Uh, as of right now, we wouldn't be allowed to have any contact. So 
it would basically be the drills and, you know, we can have light contact. You just, the rule says no prolonged contact. So we, we should be able to do something. We're hoping uh, as far as Sabercats, OFC, I, I can't see it happening. Uh, uh, so far, the Toronto, uh, the city of Toronto is saying their fields will be closed for the summer. And, uh, you know, and, and I mean, who's, who's putting their kid on the bus with 50 people right now, right? Uh, uh, not not a lot of parents are going to put their kids on the bus with 50 people right now. And, and I mean, those, those Sabercats buses are jammed with guys, and I don't see a lot of parents signing up for that. So uh, we're trying to go ahead and trying to get something going, trying to get the kids on the field some way, somewhat. Uh, we're hopeful we will be able to do something. So, uh, you know, uh, we have – it won't be a lot of cost to us. We'll pay, we'll pay the field, we'll pay the insurance costs, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll charge them enough to cover our, uh, our fees, and that's about it. And uh, – We'll go from there. We're hopeful. That's and, all it, and it proves the same as Sioux Major Hockey right now, no matter if it's House League or Rep. The, the kids are hockey right now. They're just happy to be on the field and same with football, right? They just want to be doing something. What we got right now is kids that are happy to be playing football. And like I said, it doesn't matter what we do. They're happy to be playing football. I, I have my concerns. You know, uh, we're going into probably a second summer without football. Uh, I have my concerns that maybe football's uh, popularity is going to die out. It's, it's a sport that a lot of people have some uh, – negative uh, feelings about to begin with and uh, you know after two years with everyone say you know maybe i don't want to go back to that so uh, uh we have our fears we want to keep people in in the game as much as we can uh you know high school football hopefully it goes in september if not it's going to be a second year in a row without uh without high school football uh so uh you know it, it, it's a it's a sport that has some uh, some people doesn't always have all the supporters anyways so yeah we're, we're a little worried in that regard but uh I, the kids love it. The kids we have out right now, they're in heaven. And then we got, we got about 55 kids playing football and uh, they're in heaven. So, uh, and, and, and it's been great. And, and I, I, we, we try to get the best coaches we could out. I think we got good coaches at, at every age group and uh, so far so good. A question I have is to throw it to both of you football guys. And I don't know if you've mentioned this to Jordan from the announcement last week, but your, your thoughts guys on the CFL and the XFL, uh, some type of partnership. I didn't talk to Jordan about that. I did. I did ask Jordan. Uh, I saw him the first week. I, I talked to him about uh, about when they when he thought they'd play when when the, how that would go down. But they hadn't they hadn't talked to the XFL at that point. Uh, he, he's he just had, he just wants to play football. Uh, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm going to ask him maybe see if we can get him on here when uh, when we. He's a great guy and uh, he loves he loves doing stuff for the community. So uh, yeah, he just wants to play football. As far as uh, my feelings on the XFL, I mean. They have money, right? And uh, the X and the CFL doesn't, so uh, there, there's a need there, right? So, right, Bono? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how to, how I feel about it. I mean, I love the I love the concept of the XFL. I think I think there needs to be a minor league football sy system somewhere. It's just they keep failing. It's just they don't work, and and it's just proven over and over and over again. So, I think the relationship is good for right now, but. I don't know if this is something that will be around in the future, and I don't know how this is going to affect the CFL's relationship with the NFL. And I don't know if um, the CFL really understands that, but I think it's a chance they have to take right now. I'll tell you one thing I have a fear of, and I never ever thought I'd say this, but the last three, four years coaching three-down football, I actually love it. And I do have a fear that if the XFL comes in and they kind of – you know, change the game a little bit and take away some of the uh, the Canadian rules of the, uh, you know, the three downs goes away and, uh, you know, some of the, the big wide field and some of the unique rules that we have go away. Uh, that, I would hate to see that because I, I actually really like the Canadian game and we got some, uh, you know, the unlimited motion, the, uh, the, the single point for the missed kick. We got some fun stuff and uh, I'd hate to see that go away. I've always really liked Sault Ste. Marie rules. When it came to football, you know, it seems like the Sioux combines the NFL, the best rules from the NFL and the best rules from the CFL and kind of combines them. Right. Like I used to love that the four down with the wider field and a lot of the same rules. And I don't know, I always kind of enjoyed the kind of the, the Sioux rules of football. I did. I did enjoy that, you know, a little bit of a, of a hybrid game. But uh, after coaching three down football for the last of the while, uh, it, it's really fun. It's just a, it's such a different game. It's just kind of. It can change things, and it makes you be a little more aggressive as a coach. And it's uh, maybe because I'm an old, I'm so old, and I said that's a nice change. But uh, I really enjoy the three downs. But um, that's my fear. I really, really hope that this CFL goes again. 
I have my feelings about the CFL. I think there's a little bit, there's a few too many Americans, and uh, I think the, the, we could play the, that that quality of football with almost all Canadians. But that's definitely going to go away if the XFL comes in in, in, in any uh, any manner at all. So, and and it must be hard for Jordan right now because he, like I say, he is, he is uh, like I say an employee in the CFL if you want to call it or whatever, but not getting paid, not knowing if there's a season. But training like he's getting ready for a season, so mentally and it must be hard. Sure, and and, and he had just signed a, a new contract. He, he he as a starter for the first time. He was a starter uh, before before uh, he had to renegotiate his deal. He signed a new deal, and uh, then he had to redo that deal again because of COVID. Now I don't I didn't talk to him about that. I don't I don't want to talk about his his financial things, but uh, I, I imagine there's a chance they asked him to take some kind of uh, less money because they. They don't have money right now, yep. and the CFL needs the CFL needs uh, a crowd, right? They need to have uh, people in the stands to uh, to pay their bills, and uh, and, and that's okay. But uh, yeah, I mean, he continues to work hard, and uh, uh, Jordan uh, will tell you right out, I just love football, I just want to play, and uh, and, and that's fair. He, he he's earned that right, and, he, and he's good enough player to uh, that that's what he should do. So, and and that leads into my my second last thing for tonight is. With the announcement this afternoon with the Ontario Sports Minister about we're going to hear something Wednesday about the OHL, something possibly about hubs or stuff along that lines, finan- financial help. Bono, with you, go get you to your opinion first because you've, I'm saying, not been involved with the OHL, but being penalty box and being, like you say, your thoughts sure. and will we see a hub? And do you think it's, we, I mentioned a few weeks ago, you think one of the hubs is going to be Sault Ste. Marie? In terms of playing, my attitude is I'll believe it when I see it. You know, the, uh, the, the, uh, this government has changed his mind so many times, gone back and forth. You know, they have someone who's making these decisions who, you know, the poor woman doesn't, doesn't know anything about sports. Right. And she's making all these decisions and, and really just, you know, I don't know, hurting kids in the long run by the looks of things. Do I hope, do I hope that, that the Sioux is a hub? I've said it before on this show. I love the idea of the Sioux being a hub. I think the Sioux can do it. I think the Sioux would be successful at it. I don't think the people in Sioux St. Marie, though, would be okay with it. I think that, well, sorry, I shouldn't say that. I think that the minority might not be okay with it, but they would be the loudest voice and kind of shoot this idea down or really be out against this idea. So, I love the concept. I love the idea of having a hub here. I just don't think it's realistic being in this city. I just don't. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong, but. Uh, My feelings have been consistent with everybody. uh, All the return to sports things. I I hope everybody plays. Uh, I want to, I want everyone to play. The the, the kids, uh, you know, there's kids in their draft year that have done a lot of work that, that, you know, they just, they deserve that chance to get, to, to earn their, their draft spot and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, I'll, I'll watch, hopefully it's on TV and I'll watch it. As far as us being a hub city, uh, sure, I'd like to see it. Uh, I know what Bono's saying. We, we talked about this before. A lot of, There'll be a lot of negativity, but at the end of the day, I think it's good for the city. You know, it fill, fills some of our hotels. Uh, they'll have to uh, order in food from the restaurants. And uh, so for our, our economy and stuff like that, I think it'll be great. So, uh, yeah, I'm for it. Uh, but, yeah, sure, there'll be negativity, but that's fine. And then they go talk about, I uh, say, the negativity and not to talk bad about the group that would be saying not to have it. The OHL and the minister aren't going to allow the athletes to come in without testing, probably the American, because if they if they hypothetically did it the way the OHL set up and the Thunder, or, uh, sorry, the Greyhounds division would be two of the American teams. Um, the thing is, is they're going to quarantine for 14 days. Some have talked, we might not see if we did see the OHL, might not be to May anyways, just a May, June, 24 game schedule. So, so it's something that they'd be tested. They'd be doing it right. If it would, did come into our city, won't be Sudbury, of course, because they're in the red. No, yeah, no, no, I, I, no ice. I hope they do it. I think it'll be great. Then uh, you, you, yeah, I hope they do. Yeah. And I'm like you say, it's something again, I, I just think that like you, you said, Jim is, I think they need something to have that draft come come the late summer, right? Yeah, and there's going to be negative people saying, well, well, how come they can play and then my kid can't play, my 11-year-old can't play? Well, you know what? I, I hope the, the 11-year-old gets to play too. 
So uh, that that's my take. Get everyone back playing. That's my. That's my and I, I usually we we've been we've been streaming the red and white games for for the U18s. And Coach Henderson has been on twice and said the reason is is just they're playing so the kids can play, but at the same time, some scouts and GMs at least can yeah. see some type of hockey, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And Bono, you you've been there. It's, like you say, it's been good hockey, right? Yeah, it's been great. It's been impressive. Yeah, there's definitely some kids who have stood out, and you know, it's nice for them to get some exposure. That's for sure. And like, and we we have mentioned last week, even has even gotten a little chippy with even teammates. So it's something that it shows the the competitive side of any athlete, right? Yeah, One thing we absolutely. could do, Jay, maybe is uh, since we you know since we've been on the topic a little bit of uh, girls hockey, is uh, maybe find out. I think I think Greg Brazo is the coach of the uh, the midget uh, girls team. Uh, Maybe we could stream if they want to have a red and white game or something. We could reach out to him and uh, make that offer. I think that would be nice for for uh, for them too. So uh, maybe yeah, that's something with something we can look into. I'll reach out to Greg and like that. Talk to yeah. Greg through social media quite a bit. And last thing I'm going to mention is the Matthew Wheaton Legacy Tournament. The registration's out. Um, not going to share it until uh, later in the week because it, they want to get all their banking stuff done and ready. But by the end of the week, look on SueSports.com for the Matthew Legacy Tournament, and I, again, they're going to come on next week. We have Marty Turco on, but they're going to come on after Marty and just touch base about dates and a little bit more info about, about the tournament. That's awesome. So That's great. So we'll be back. Be the, who's going to be the quarterback of the uh, SueSports.com team, Bono, or? Uh... I'll, be the, I'll, be, I'll be the water boy. <laughs> if I could throw more than 10, 10 yards, maybe I would be. But yeah, that's why I'm off too. So yeah. no again, I know I'll let you guys go. But I was sitting yesterday in between games uh, at, uh, like, say, at the John Rhodes, and talked to Steve Heima for a minute, and we were talking Sioux Steelers, and he said that's the biggest problem the Steelers have to do is to find the quarterback who's can, who's there all the time, and like you say, that's one of the hardest positions to fill, right, Jim? That's the biggest problem in the whole city. I mean, uh, we we have uh, we have a couple guys sewing with our with our grade nine and grade ten groups uh, on Tuesdays, and then uh, Thursday night we have uh, we have three quarterbacks out. Uh, Jordan Robinson Rice out. He's he's going to uh, U of T, I believe, and then we got the you know uh, Barnes and uh, and Johnson out throwing. But I mean, that, that's it. We don't have any other quarterbacks, so it, it, it's tough, and uh, uh, it really is, and, and it's. It's a hard position at any level, right, Bono? I mean, it's hard, it's hard Very. to NFL. So. Bono, flag football, what position would you play? Oh, I, I'm I'm a legend in the touch football league here, okay? I'm a wide receiver all day long. <laughs> yeah. Em emphasis on the wide. Wide. Yeah. <laughs> there's okay. always some – every year there's people that get burned by my uh, elusive speed. <laughs> Yeah. But he's not. He's not talking about going up the steps at the John Road to the bar, though. That's right. Uh -huh. You're good at that. <laughs> yeah. Well, All guys, right. thanks. Thanks yeah. a lot, and hey, everybody, join us next week when we have Marty Turco on from Sault Ste. Marie and former NHL goaltender. Thank you. Thanks, guys.